Welcome all, and thanks for joining this event on economic inequality. I'm really pleased to be here to talk a bit about the research group's recent work on COVID-19. Now, as Marissa mentioned, I'm the leader of the research group's household and regional policy work. And in addition, I'm an editor of the Liberty Street Economics, which is the New York Fed's research blog. Um, and both of these roles have changed really dramatically since early March, when the COVID pandemic rapidly became the central fact in almost all the work being done in the research group. What that means is that the economists have shif shifted almost all their efforts to respond to COVID. And a lot of that work is available for you to read and respond to. Today, I'll tell you a little bit about the work that is or will be in the public domain related to COVID-19. It's actually quite a lot. Liberty Street Economics, on which I'll focus today, published its last pre-COVID post on March 4th. Some of you will remember that that was the day we released four posts on inequality in the labor market. By mid-March, the blog had shifted its focus to emphasize work related to the COVID pandemic. And since then, since mid-March, we've published 45 posts, and all but four are very closely related to COVID. Now, some of this work focuses on financial markets, like the liquidity in the US market for treasury debt, or descriptions of the many facilities that the Federal Reserve has stood up to keep credit flowing during the crisis. But many of the posts touch in some way, or are even directly focused on, the way that the pandemic is affecting different kinds of people operating in different parts of the economy. And given today's audience, I'd like to take a few minutes to let the, to let the audience know about that work and to preview some, some, some coming attractions. So there are many aspects of the pandemic's differential impact on our country. Our work here at the New York Fed has focused on three related sets of issues. First is the level of preparation for the effects of a large economic shock. For example, job stability or precautionary savings among different, different types of households. In a post addressing this question, a group of us show who has access to available credit. While household balance sheets were overall in very good shape leading into the crisis, there was very significant heterogeneity. For example, the top quarter of borrowers in the richest zip codes had, on average, over $30,000 in available credit card borrowing in March. But in low income neighborhoods, the median is under $400. So there's tremendous variation in the ability to use credit to cushion the shock that hit the economy. So the second main question is, who was hit by the shock and in what ways? Well, first and foremost, as most of you know, is the fact that the COVID infection and death rates are highly correlated with race and income, as well as the type of neighborhood in which a person lives. In a post that appeared earlier this month, Raji Chakrabarty and Will Nober show that low-income minority counties suffer the highest rates of COVID incidents in terms of cases per capita, and that this vulnerability is not explained entirely by overall population density. The authors propose some hypotheses for these results, including differential access to healthcare. They don't have a complete explanation yet, but they promise follow-up work. One additional piece of evidence on this question is put forward by Fed economist Laura Pilosoff, in her post, Which Workers Bear the Burden of Social Distancing Policies. Laura and her co-authors identify jobs that require close physical proximity and are not easily done from a remote location. These jobs turn out to be disproportionately held by workers who are poor, non-white, and rent their homes rather than own. For those jobs deemed essential, this means increased exposure to the virus and is likely part of the story for higher incidents. For those not deemed essential, COVID manifests as a hit to their economic well-being. The main manifestation of this phenomenon is job loss. The most disadvantaged workers have suffered much higher job loss rates than their more advantaged counterparts. This leads us to a set of work that explores how the pandemic has affected the economic situation for different kinds of households. Here we have a very large body of work, and I won't try to summarize it all. I will note, though, that there are lots of differentiators here ranging from race and income to geographic location. For example, our regional team has reported at very high frequency the results of our regional business surveys, which have shown how our region is faring in comparison to the rest of the nation. Poorly at first, with the, incidence, with the high incidence here, but recently better. 
Another example is work by Hao Yang Liu and Desi Volker that shows which kinds of places got the initial round of Paycheck Protection Program loans. Here's a hint. They were not the places hardest hit by COVID. Additional policy analyses include examination of the role of reopening on physical distancing. Raji and her co-author Maxim Pinkovsky find that formal reopenings do increase social interactions, suggesting that public policy can have important effects on behavior above and beyond individuals' decisions, and that places with more cautious reopening plans may well see a slower increase in activity. Now, much of the public relief effort found in the CARES Act helps households with debt payments. And as I'm sure we'll hear about this more late shortly, this is especially consequential for households who pay for their housing via a federally backed mortgage. In some work that will appear soon, we use our consumer credit panel to explore the effect of CARES Act forbearance programs on mortgage and student loan payments on different kinds of places like low and high income places and majority minority areas. Just as importantly, we examine what kinds of people don't have either of these accounts and are left out of these helpful programs. Finally, what are the different groups' expectations for recovery? We have a series of posts that explore household expe expectations using our survey of consumer expectations. A primary conclusion is that the outbreak has set expectations for the future plummeting, whether it be expectations of income or spending. An interesting aspect of this decline in optimism is that it has been pervasive. People from all walks of life expect the pandemic to affect, the, affect them negatively. Nonetheless, as we have seen, much of the actual impact has been concentrated among our most vulnerable households. Looking ahead, the expiration of some important policy interventions over the next few months will likely change the picture, although our surveys show that many households expect more relief to be coming. And there will be much more to come from us. Analyses of how these expirations are affecting different households, new series on the interaction of COVID and household debt, and how reopenings are affecting economic activity and labor market outcomes. I'll close by pointing out that all the work I've described here fits comfortably within the mandate of the Federal Reserve. We're tasked with ensuring maximum sustainable employment, and that means keeping everyone engaged in the economy. It also involves special attention to the employment outlook for those most vulnerable to job losses and those most affected by it. So the analyses I've described here are actually a small part of what we've been doing. The rest is for internal, not public consumption. But I can assure you that discussions of the way the crisis is affecting different places, sectors, and people are central to all of our internal policy debates. So thank you all again for being here, and I look forward to continued discussion of these topics. With that, I'll turn it back over to Marissa. Thank you so much, Andy, for those updates. Looking forward to more research this summer. Our next part is the impact of COVID-19 on New York City's housing, housing market presented by Ingrid Gould Ellen, faculty director at NYU Furman Center. Ingrid, thank you so much for being here with us and thank you for your continued partnership. Over to you. Thank you, Marissa. I'm gonna share some analyses um, that we've done at the Furman Center showing how the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting and will affect renters across New York City and, and New York State. The, the uh, damage COVID-19 has wrought on both the US and the New York economy is unprecedented and it's widespread. Yet as Andy already um, emphasized, the damage has not been felt evenly. Our analyses show that, uh, that, the, um, that, that the impact has been particularly devastating to renters who tend to have fewer savings than, than homeowners and who are disproportionately likely to work in the occupations and the industries that are most affected by the, the virus. We also find that renters living in small buildings are disproportionately at risk. And, and finally, and disturbingly, Black and Latino households are once again especially vulnerable, just as they were in the last housing crisis. In, in terms of renters, uh, this graph shows that in New York City, the vast majority of low and moderate income uh, households with at least one adult employed in, a, in an occupation vulnerable to COVID-related job loss rent rather than own their homes. Um, in particular, more than 85% than 
of households um, with vulnerable workers and incomes below 50,000 um, rented their homes and over, and, and 90% of those with incomes below 30 per, uh, below $30,000 rented their homes. Given the high rents in New York, these households are, are very unlikely to have any significant savings to help them weather these, these income losses. Um, to get a sense of the scale of the need, uh, we used unemployment insurance claims by, by industry to estimate jobs and earnings losses for New York renters. Uh, we assume that about a third of those experiencing job loss don't, uh, don't receive unemployment insurance using take-up estimates from um, James Parrott and Andrew Stetner. And in total, um, we estimate that 1.2 million renter households in New York State um, have suffered job loss or, or significant earnings loss due to uh, COVID-19. In New York City, that number is 735,000. And the losses and earnings are enormous, uh, amounting to nearly $5 billion per month in New York State and $3.5 billion in, in New York City. In the short run, uh, the CARES Act benefits have helped eligible renters uh, make up most of those uh, lost wages between the one-time stimulus and the extra $600 per week in, in unemployment um, insurance uh, through July 31st. Uh, and those, those benefits, these benefits have been, have been critical, but not all renters are eligible for CARES Act benefits. And if jobs don't return, renters will face enormous shortfalls in August um, if, the, if the CARES Act benefits are, are not extended at that point. Uh, to give a sense of the impacts on particular households, um, we show here four different sort of hypothetical households, each of whom had a, a, a rent burden, faced a rent burden prior to the COVID crisis of 35%, meaning that they had to spend 35% of their, of their income on rent. And through July 31st, right, these households see, see little change and maybe even some improvement in, in rent and some in re reduction in, in rent burden due, due to the CARES Act benefits, but come August, right, they would all see their rent burdens jump to over 70% of income. Uh, in fact, the household with two earners, each earning $20,000 initially, and only one of whom is eligible for unemployment insurance, would actually face rent payments in August that exceed their, their monthly income. So we tried to aggregate the, the amount of these shortfalls and to estimate the amount of rental income, the rental assistance, that would be needed to return renters across the state to their to their pre-COVID rent burden levels or to or to 30%, whichever, whichever is higher. Um, and we estimate that the, in New York State, the amount of, of monthly assistance needed to get renters back to those rent burdens um, would be 310 million um, uh, in July, but jumped to $743 million in August when the Enhanced CARES Act benefits end. Um, this, assumes, this assumes that um, a quarter of jobs return, return by that point. Um, if we focus on, on low-income households who are the least likely to have savings, uh, we, um, we naturally see sort of the aggregate rental assistance uh, needed falls um, because it's you're, you're targeting a smaller set of households. And specifically, if we restrict to renters who earn less than 80% of their, of their area, local area median income, then the rental assistance needed um, to, to, um, for them to get back to their pre-COVID rent burdens would be 391 million across the state. Um, a, a lot of much of this need, not all of it though, will be in New York City, where we estimate that the monthly rental assistance needed to take uh, renter households back to their pre-COVID rent burdens would be would jump from 241 million in in July up to 532 million in in August. Um, and again, if we if we focus just on low-income renters, the estimated need would be 267 million in August. So these are these are large numbers. Um, now, to be clear, there's a lot of uncertainty in these estimates, um, and their magnitude depends on uh, many factors, which we don't know. We can't we can't pin down like the actual take up of unemployment insurance, 
the rate of job recovery, any potential rent reductions over time. Um, uh, you know, for this analysis, we assume no rent reductions. And, and you know, but, but what's clear is that many, many renters across the city and across the state will struggle to pay their rents in August, um, again, if, if CARES Act benefits are not are not extended. Um, and some renters will be hit harder than others. Um, we found that we find that Black and, and, and Hispanic renters, renters in small buildings, and renters in particular neighborhoods um, are especially vulnerable. Um, most notably, we expect to see substantial racial disparities in income losses um, that will that will widen the already large, uh, you know, pre-existing racial gaps um, in earnings. We estimated that nearly half of Hispanic wage earners and 38 percent of, of black wage earners in New York City um, worked in, in work in vulnerable occupations as compared to less than a quarter of non-Hispanic whites. We also find that renters in more vulnerable occupations are disproportionately likely to live in small buildings. Nearly a third, what this chart shows is that nearly a third of vulnerable renters live in buildings with fewer than five units. The owners of these small buildings are more likely to be people of color and more likely to be small investors who are less equipped to, to weather long periods of long payment, right? Facing, facing non-payment, they will, they will struggle to, to make their mortgage payments, struggle to pay their property taxes, and struggle to cover the everyday, um, the, 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 the uh, ongoing maintenance and operating expenses, which, which could in turn have significant spillover effects on local budgets and economies. And, and I know um, Erica Pothick is gonna talk more about these waterfall effects in, in her presentation. Um, finally, while Renters and communities um, across the state and across the city are struggling to pay rent as their incomes have fallen. The losses are larger in, in certain neighborhoods, raising the risk of, of concentrated vacancies and, and concentrated concentrations of financially distressed housing. Um, within New York City, we find that the hardest hit neighborhoods, um, which we define are those that we estimate that more than 60 percent of renters work in occupations vulnerable to, to, to job loss, here, here they're shaded in yellow, are clustered in the South Bronx, in, in Northern Queens, and in some parts of, of Brooklyn. Um, the, the neighborhoods with the smallest vulnerable household shares, which are shaded in black, are in Manhattan below 125th Street and in, in uh, Northwest Brooklyn. And, and the neighborhoods in shaded in gray, I should say, are those for which the estimates are just simply too noisy for us to for us to report them, unfortunately. Um, so sadly, um, but perhaps not surprisingly, those of you who who know New York and um, can see this map um, can see that these locations map onto pre-existing um, housing market inequality. So looking at um, four of New York City's boroughs, as is again, we don't have sufficient sample size um, to to estimate likely job losses in Staten Island, we show that the neighborhoods with the, the most households at risk of, house, of, of job loss are also the neighborhoods that fall in the top third of, of rent burden. So these are also the, the neighborhoods that had the most, uh, had more rent burdened households going into the crisis. So, you know, for instance, you, know, you can see all the neighborhoods with more, where more than 60% of renter households are vulnerable to job loss are also in the top third of neighborhoods with respect to pre-existing rent burden. Um, the foreclosure crisis um, taught us about the, the uh, what can be sort of the, the devastating ripple effects of financially distressed buildings on surrounding properties and even crime. Um, so it's critical to be vigilant about signs of distress in these neighborhoods, but, but more importantly, it's critical to provide assistance to renters and, and landlords to help them get through this enormously difficult period. So Marissa, I will pass it back to you now. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Talk about efficiency. We still have three minutes to spare. So thank
thank you so much Andrew, for your continued partnership. We're now going to move to COVID-19 and access to mortgage credit, presented by Lori Goodman, Vice President at the Urban Institute. Lori, over to you. Thank you very much, and thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I'd like to talk about COVID-19 and access to uh, mortgage credit. Um, I'm going to actually start with, I'm going to basically make four points today. First, housing is the single best way to build wealth. There are vast differences in the homeownership rate by race, even correcting for income. Second, on the surface, the housing market seems strong. Homeowners are hit far less hard by, than co by COVID-19 than renters and forbearance rates are a lot lower than expected. Prices, uh, home prices are up and purchase applications are strong. However, beneath the surface, credit has tightened considerably. And when credit availability becomes an issue, minority borrowers tend to be disproportionately affected. So with that, um, let's actually look at the value of home ownership in building wealth. So if you look at the right-hand side of this page, this is a survey of consumer finance data on total wealth of owners versus renters. You can see that for all um, that for all homeowners, the median wealth is 231,000 versus less than $5,000 for renters. Um, and obviously, there there are pretty wide differences um, in terms of um, by by race and ethnicity. If you look at the left hand side of this page, this shows you for homeowners median wealth and shows you the home equity as a portion of that wealth. So the median wealth overall is about 230, um, 231,000. It's higher for whites and Asians, lower for blacks and Hispanics. However, for blacks and Hispanics, housing wealth makes up a much larger portion of overall wealth than it does for whites and Asians. Uh, this shows you home ownership rates by race ethnicity. You can see the home ownership rate for whites is 72.2%. Um, for Asians, 59.5%. Hispanics, 47.5%. And for Blacks, 41.7%. I do want to point out that the Black home ownership rate is lower than it was in 1968 when the fair, when fair, when the fair housing laws were passed. This shows you um, home ownership rates by income, whites versus blacks. And what you see here is that the um, home ownership rate um, for uh, the home ownership rate is very, very different. At the very upper end, there is not a big difference between um, whites and blacks. I mean, still, still a 10 percentage um, point difference. The biggest difference are is in the twenty-five to fifty thousand dollar area, and um, in the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar area, huge differences in terms of the black versus white home ownership um, rate. Uh, um, on the surface, the housing market seems very strong, and homeowners seem to have held up very well. This slide shows you the unemployment rate for owners versus renters, and you can see that the home ownership rate for owners has been consistently lower. Than for renters, on average, the home ownership rate for homeowners is about um, 80% of the overall home ownership rate. It's about 135% for renters. Um, are you seeing my slides okay, Marissa? Okay. Um, this shows you that homeowners are less likely to work in the five most vulnerable industries, accommodation and food, construction, entertainment, other service, which is things like hair salons and retail, um, then our renters, 30.3% of homeowners are in the five most vulnerable industries versus about 38% of renters. Um, this um, the MBA, um, so basically homeowners were in better shape to begin with going into COVID-19. Um, they had lower unemployment rates. Um, the average, the median income for homeowners is about $78,000. It's about $41,000 for renters. They were less affected by COVID-19. This shows you the, MB the Mortgage Bankers Association keeps track of forbearance. Um, that is homeowners that basically say, I can't pay, I can't pay my mortgage. Um, and you can see that the overall forbearance rate, um, this is last 
week's number of 8.53. This past week, it was 8.48%. Going into COVID-19, um, the, the industry estimate was about 25% of homeowners would, um, would ask for forbearance. We estimated 12% and looked crazy, crazy low. At this point, we look crazy, crazy high. Um, it's important to realize, though, that these, for, and obviously the forbearance um, numbers depend on whether you're a, a GSE mortgage where the forbearance rate is much lower or a um, Ginnie Mae mortgage or a private label mortgage um, or where the forbearance rates are somewhat higher than the average. But the forbearance rates are a lot lower than industry expectations. In addition, a lot of the borrowers who have asked for forbearance are actually continuing to make payments on their mortgage. In some cases, it's about half. A lot of this is due, as um, Ingrid mentioned, to the fact that the um, unemployment benefits plus the extra $600 a week for the CARES Act are very, very generous. For the median homeowner, because the incomes are relatively high, they're not replacing their all of their income. However, for the homeowners at the 25th percentile, um, the CARES Act plus $600 a week basically replaces the income that it, that is replaces the lost income if one is unemployed. It remains to be seen how much forbearance spikes after the um, extra $600 a week runs out at the end of July. Um, hopefully it, it won't spike a lot, but it, it um, there will be an effect. Now let me move on to the housing market. The housing market has surprised us all by its strength. This slide shows you what's happened to the um, purchase applications index. You can see um, this shows you 2018, 2019, and the blue line is 2020 through June. You can see that you know when COVID-19 first hit, mortgage applications took a took a fairly large dip. However, they recovered very, very quickly. And mortgage applications are now shockingly higher than they were at this time in 2019 and 2020. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. One of the big ones is that rates are historically low. So what that's done is pulled forward a lot of demand. You're thinking about buying a house. You still have your job. So you say, yes, this is a great time to take that plunge. The immediate... Um, People's reaction um, to um, this was home prices will be down. In fact, home prices are not down. So this is Redfin data through early June showing that um, 2020 prices are actually higher than 2019 prices. If you look on a year over year basis, what you see is that home prices started to decelerate very, very rapidly in April and May. They actually stabilized in early June and turned and turned up. And so home prices have, and actually most economists are ex actually expecting 2020 home prices to be up for the year. So what is so what has happened? Um, it looks like the housing market is healthy. What are the issues? So beneath the surface, credit availability has become an issue. We care about credit availability because it allows people to become homeowners and home ownership is the single best way to build wealth. This shows you the MBA mortgage credit availability index in January and February that index was hovering around um, 181 now it's down to 129. Um, how, um, so overall it's off by 28.6%. The government index is off by 16.1%. The conventional conforming index is off by about 15.8%. And the jumbo index is off by 53.3%. Um, they do not measure the non-qualified mortgage um, index, which is basically loans to self-employed borrowers. That's basically dead. Um, you'll notice the dichotomy here is between the parts of the market that are covered by where the Federal Reserve has intervened, which is very heavily in the agency market. The market is basically stabilized. The parts of the market where the Federal Reserve has not intervened, that is um, bank portfolios and private label securities, the market has struggled. Um, and you can see that very clearly in these credit availability numbers. Now you look and you say, well, gee, how big a deal is being is credit availability being down by around 16%? The answer is it can make a big difference. 
this just shows you, um, and the way it makes a big difference is um, basically originators have imposed their overlays on top of the agency credit boxes. So even though the agency credit boxes, that is the um, FHA, VA, Freddie and Fannie credit boxes haven't changed very much, originators have imposed overlays on top of those boxes. So um, those overlays arise for two reasons. The first is that um, e that if a borrower doesn't make his, their payments, they are required. Um, the servicer is required to advance um, for a period of time, um, and they're required to advance um, taxes and insurance payments basically forever. Um, and secondly. If a loan goes into forbearance before it is actually sold to the GSEs or to FHA, um, that loan will incur a huge penalty. So basically, the way originators cope with this is they say, "Well, I'm willing to make that. I I don't want to make a loan that has a high prob that has any probability of going into forbearance um, at all." So um, what they've done is they put overlays on top of the agency credit box, and you can see here if you put it. Seven eight. If you put a six eighty FICO cutoff on top of um, two thousand and nineteen origination, you squeeze out about fifty percent of Ginny of the Ginny May loans, about eight percent of Fannie and Freddie loans. Um, if you put a seven hundred FICO cutoff, you squeeze out about sixty three percent of Ginny May loans, about fifteen percent of Fannie and Freddie loans. Of course, not all originators are putting these overlays on but many are. So in the aggregate, you've had a decrease in credit availability that's pretty sizable. If you look at Ginnie Mae purchase activity, you can see the percent FICOs less than 700 went from 65% in January of 2019 to 62% uh, in January of 2020 to 61% in April. Fannie purchases went from um, 18% to 14% to 13%. That is, cre the credit box was already tightening going into COVID-19, and it was accelerated by the virus. Um, if you look at um, refi activity, you can see that it's tightened even more. If we put, um, a lot of originators are also putting debt to income overlays on these mortgages. Um, and you can see, so for example, in January of 2019, the percentage of mortgages with FICOs less than 700 and debt to income ratios greater than 40 was about 44%. It's now 37%. For Fannie purchase activity, 9.2% to 5.2%. Ginnie Mae refi activity, 39% down to 8.5%. And Fannie and Freddie refi activity, show similar declines. So there's been a huge con um, contraction in credit availability and there's more to come. Remember, if you bought a home in April, chances are you filed that mortgage application in late April, it'll close in June and we'll get the data in early July. So there's definitely more credit tightening to come, but certainly we've seen huge signs of it. So when credit availability becomes an issue, it affects minority borrowers the most. This shows you FICO scores, by the FICO score distribution by race. So you can see for white borrowers, about 17% have FICOs below 620. For black borrowers, that number is 38.3%, 27.2% for Hispanic borrowers, and around 9% for Asian borrowers. So very, very different FICO distributions so when you, if you sort of put a 680 FICO overlay or a 700 FICO overlay, you are clearly impacting Black and Hispanic borrowers the most. Um, this shows you 2018 uh, mortgage originations. We use um, HUMDA data for this. FICO, debt to income, and, else, and loan to value ratios by race ethnicity. Again, making the same point that when credit availability is tight, you are impacting Hispanic borrowers and black borrowers more than you're impacting um, white borrowers or Asian borrowers. This shows you average FICO scores for 2018 originations, 748 for non-Hispanic white borrowers, 710 for Hispanic white borrowers, 691 for black, for black borrowers. 
The median combined loan to value ratio on purchase mortgages is considerably lower for non-Hispanic white borrowers than it is for Hispanic white borrowers or black borrowers. And the debt to income ratio is also lower for non-Hispanic white borrowers than it is for Hispanic white borrowers or black borrowers. So bottom line, credit availability has tightened a lot. The impact of that is gonna fall disproportionately on um, Hispanic, on potential Hispanic homeowners and potential black homeowners. Um, it, is the, it is the result of, um, it is the result of tightening mortgage credit and there are actually policy solutions that can be discussed to try to stem this tightening in credit availability. So with that, um, let me turn it back to you, Marissa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lori. Appreciate it. Up next, we have the waterfall framework, understanding key inequities within the housing market and principles of solutions. Presented by Erica Pothig, Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at the Urban Institute. Erica, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you to you and David for um, hosting this event and to my uh, esteemed uh, colleagues who are presenting today. Um, I hope my presentation complements um, especially um, what uh, Ingrid has already presented and what I'm sure Louise will give us more of an um, insight into uh, in a moment. I want to frame the set of policy uh, options that are on the table and the considerations that we have right now. Uh, Ingrid set up, I think, some of the dynamics and dilemmas facing us um, as we understand the impact of COVID-19 for renters who have lost employment uh, during this crisis, but also the renters who have faced uh, rent burdens before the crisis and already faced housing instability or homelessness um, and are maybe even employed at this moment uh, doing some of the essential work that has enabled so many of us to work from home and many of whom are people of color. Um, and so I wanna cover what uh, some of those impacts are uh, in this crisis. Um, at a national um, level and relate that to then some of the policy discussions and debates that are ongoing right now. So as I said, even before COVID-19, low-income households faced immense rent burdens. And you see from this chart that those rent burdens were largely faced, the most severe rent burdens were largely faced by households, uh, extremely um, uh, low-income households um, who earn less than 30 percent of area median income. But as Ingrid pointed out, the job losses have increased rent burdens for um, employee, uh, employed people across every income group. As you can see here, because ELI renters were already rent burdened before the crisis, they have definitely become more rent burdened as a result of this crisis. But um, uh, income groups uh, between 80 and 100 percent and 100 and 150 percent and over 150 percent of AMI have also been affected uh, by the COVID crisis and lost income as a result. So Ingrid also pointed out and, and Lori mentioned that the unemployment insurance has played a kind of critical role in stabilizing the crisis. The eviction moratoria that are have been in place in so many states and cities across the country have prevented evictions from happening uh, and some of the worst outcomes at this particular state. So when we look at some of the national data and the census has created this new household pulse data, um, we do know that about 20% of all renter households had at least one member of uh, that household experience a job loss between February and April. Um, and we've been monitoring this data to understand what is happening in terms of their rent payment. We're learning that um, in many cases um, across the country, maybe not as much in the higher cost markets, um, the unemployment insurance have played a really important role in mitigating um, loss of housing and housing instability and has, have enabled people to continue to pay rent. Um, but a lot of that combined assistance is definitely flowing to um, higher income renters at this particular stage. Um, so what happens uh, if rent to renter households once unemployment assistance expires, as Ingrid points out, that is at the end of July. Well, there is a waterfall of effects 
we know that tenants who lose income can't pay rent face potential eviction and then potential homelessness or overcrowding in other housing. Thus, then property owners and landlords can't cover the operating costs of the building, uh, including uh, the, um, what they need to pay to their lenders and investors or to the city for services and taxes. When they can't pay their lenders, the capital markets tighten credit and lenders can't lend or won't lend. I think Lori gave us some insight into the dynamics in the homeownership market, even though that market seemingly is healthy at this particular stage. And if lenders can't or won't lend, then the already tight housing supply we have across the country and in many markets like uh, New York's becomes even tighter. So we are thinking about the policy interventions uh, aligned to both the so immediate challenges, the intermediate challenges, and the long-term challenges that I wanna cover right now. So in this month uh, and over the uh, course of uh, the next few months, um, we do know, as I mentioned, that the CARES Act UI payments um, don't re fully replace income in some places, uh, but have uh, replaced income in a lot of places across the US. But they don't, those payments don't cover everybody we know. So not all unemployed uh, renters uh, are receiving the benefit of uh, CARES Act UI payments, and they're facing, I think, particular challenges. Um, so not all owners of rental housing uh, have mortgages that allow them to apply for a forbearance and, and that doesn't apply. And those uh, owners are facing particular financial insolvency when they have tenants who are unable to make full or partial rent payments. So there is instability in the market right now where these gaps exist. But if the UI payments do not get extended uh, by Congress, we know that um, low and moderate income uh, renters who have lost income will face incredible financial burdens that we've already outlined um, due to um, limited savings and other kinds of cushions um, that they have to rely upon. And they may face and are likely to face housing instability in the intermediate term. Um, owners um, who are now spending down operating reserves uh, to limited levels uh, and may no longer be able to qualify for mortgage forbearance as those policies expire, would also face financial insolvency. And as a result, the capital markets and multifamily servicers uh, who may need to continue to meet their obligations are gonna face challenges as well. And it begins to, I think, start to look a lot like some of the dimensions of the housing crisis we faced um, 10 years ago. Now, um, these effects uh, are obviously preventable uh, if we stabilize the um, rent burdened uh, renters. Um, and uh, we can do that in a number of different ways to prevent the homelessness. And I'll come to that in a moment. But we could also imagine that um, owners and landlords, Ingrid already pointed out, many of the affected renters live in smaller properties. Um, a lot of those properties are owned by um, entrepreneurs of color uh, who may be faced with losing them, selling them to larger owners who may or may not keep them affordable. And there are other property owners who also may face foreclosure. This kind of instability um, that we saw in the last housing crisis absolutely affects neighborhoods uh, more broadly. Um, and it's something that we, if we can, need to prevent uh, from happening again. Um, we know that if capital markets take a hit, as I mentioned before, the lending standards will tighten, as Lori pointed out, in the homeownership market. Um, and then this funding for development and rehabilitation of rental housing uh, also starts to dry up and the rental supply um, continues to tighten in ways um, that are already tight in so many markets uh, across the country. So in the short term, Congress really faces a, a choice as renters face a cliff. Um, they have kind of two options on the table. One is to extend unemployment insurance in some kind of way or some kind of income supp supplement um, to help those who have faced rent burdens. Um, and or they could uh, allocate resources for rental assistance, supplementing uh, unemployment assistance or giving rental assistance to 
um, meet, help people meet their previous rent burden or alleviate their existing rent burden. Then there are some options on the table that are being debated uh, in, on the Hill and, and, and within the housing field. Um, who should be supported? Households who have experienced job loss at this moment, and I showed the first slide to um, enable you to see that um, many of the people who've been affected by the job loss are at slightly higher income than the ELI renters who already have the highest uh, rent burdens. Or should it include all rent burdened uh, renter households assisting those who face rent burdens before COVID, again, many of whom are serving in roles that have, are enabling so many of us to stay um, working from home and many of those um, folks are people of color. So there is a real sort of equity consideration here as we consider the policy options on the table. Um, my colleagues at the Urban Institute in collaboration uh, with Ingrid and her colleagues at NYU Furman Center and the Turner Center at UC Berkeley and the Joint Center at, um, for Housing at Harvard all collaborated in the development of a set of options and estimates to figure out what level of um, federal investment would be required on a monthly basis um, to fill some of these gaps under some of these different assumptions. Um, so the, um, if you see here, the most uh, ex um, expensive option at $21.3 billion a month is assuming that no other employment benefits would be um, authorized. Uh, and this would largely focus um, on households that experience a job loss and bring them back to their prior level of rent burden with a cap of 30% um, would be the kind of monthly cost of enacting that policy. But we give other parameters uh, here in a paper that we published last week and we'll be posting the state by state um, impacts, um, I think, tomorrow. Um, so this gives you a sense of enabling or helping to support the debate and conversation in Congress about the cost of some of the different options, but wanting to put on the table an option that would alleviate the rent burden for all renters, regardless of recent job loss, which is the column um, at the bottom. Now, many different vehicles are available for um, disseminating rental assistance and the HEROES Act um, that the House is contemplating support for, um, it, it contains a number of different vehicles. ESG is one of the vehicles, uh, main vehicles, but so too are vouchers, home funding, uh, CDBG, as well as vehicles at Treasury have all been uh, uh, debated and discussed as potential options. In a work that we're doing with the Rental Crisis Working Group, I, we agree that a portfolio approach is needed, um, that uh, support uh, given directly to renters is essential, but also packages support that allow well, um, owners of rental properties with a large number of affected renters is also an efficient and effective way to distribute rental assistance. Um, so keeping a number of different options on the table uh, when we are in such a dynamic and different situation in so many ge geographies across the country, um, seems very important at this time. Um, but in addition to allocating resources for rental assistance, it's also critically important, especially when those resources are being distributed to um, property owners to really marry those with tenant protections to ensure that those tenants have stable housing and are not evicted. Um, so that um, we don't um, add more people, vulnerable renters to our homeless population. And maybe through this crisis, we can even address the existing homeless challenge that we have today um, that is affecting so many um, people of color and uh, vulnerable um, folks. Thank you very much uh, for this um, opportunity to share these ideas with you today. I turn it back to you, Marissa. Thank you so much, Erica, for that approach and framework. Our last panelist presenting on tools and policy solutions to increase equity in the housing safety net is Louise Carroll, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Louise, thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you to the Federal Reserve Bank and the Urban Institute for hosting this conversation. Um, and I am honored to be part 
of this conversation with my other distinguished guests. Um, you've heard a lot already about the in inequities that um, have been exposed by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. What I'd like to say is that we already knew these equities existed. Uh, the maps that you saw from the Furman Center uh, also are maps that reflect housing insecurity before COVID, um, food insecurity before COVID, and um, lack of health services. And so as we were watching the crisis unfold long before the governor's um, pause or stay at home order, we realized that it was going to be, if it lasted, if it was of any um, long duration, we were going to need federal help. So we quickly started working with our partners to seek federal help in, in some of the ways you've heard already. Um, you know, maybe a lending facility for building owners who'd faced a significant rental loss, maybe renters, assistance, et cetera. But meanwhile, you know, we had to think about our own agency. We have a um, pandemic planning um, book, um, well, not a pandemic plan, but a casualty book, basically, that we use if agencies' operations are disrupted in a hurricane or some other crisis. And we quickly realized that this was not going to work for a pandemic. And so we had to take that book and throw it away and think how if housing was a crisis before housing would remain a crisis during a pandemic and housing would become a bigger crisis after the pandemic and so we quickly realized that we needed to keep our code in in code inspectors and code enforcement feet and boots on the ground so that we could protect tenants who had complaints about heat and hot water um, and other life and safety conditions in the housing that um, they were living in. We also realized that we needed to keep Section 8 going. We needed to provide Section 8 not, not only um, for people who were qualified, but even for folks that we had deemed maybe were ineligible and we had scheduled hearings for them or people who were about to lose a Section 8 or needed to renew Section 8. We, we basically let everyone know if you have Section 8, you can keep it. Um, if you were scheduled for a hearing, never mind, you would keep your Section 8 throughout the pandemic. If you'd lost income uh, because of COVID, that we would increase your benefits. The, the next thing we realized was that, okay, um, we, we, we're going, there's going to be rental insecurity. Um, how can we help people who are not on Section 8? And so we had hoped to use some of the money from the CARES Act, um, some of the CDBG money for rental building rental assistance program and tenants rental assistance program. But then we worked with our um, Human Resources Administration and realized that the, their one shots program, which is paired with public assistance, was a more efficient way of reaching um, folks who needed rental assistance. So we pledged some of our staff, um, probably about 50 staff, to work with them um, in order to help them get their rental assistance program going because they were inundated with um, food stamp requests. We also, um, felt that our marketing pipeline, we are the largest municipal um, agency in the country, and we have a very ambitious housing plan to create 300,000 units by 2026. Um, we had a lot of units that were ready to be marketed to households. And so we decided that we had to keep that marketing going. We had to find a way to make sure that in the pandemic, we would change our rules to make it easier for folks to apply online and have a fully um, social distance process. And, um, you know, we were successful in having about 1,400 units online. Uh, we looked at the overcrowding crisis. We thought about the folks in shelter 
and we reached out to our developers who had these units available and said, you know, the law says you have to have 15% set aside for homeless tenants. How about increasing that to 30% set aside? And we will give you a streamlined process for getting people out of shelter and into those units. And we had a really, we, we made that ask in March. And within a month, we had about 250 units. Um, if, you, if you multiply by, by two, let's say for households, about 400 households would be served by that initial response. And so, you know, we, we, then we, we had to think about, okay, our pipeline, right? What, what does housing look like in, in this climate? Um, how would we continue to produce housing? Because we recognize that housing is not only a means of providing shelter to the lowest income New Yorkers, but it's also an economic recovery and a job creator. And so, you know, we worked with, uh, we had pledged to produce, um, preserve or build at least 25,000 units um, of preservation and new construction housing. And we had already met that um, mark. We had already hit 20, 28,000. And so we, we and, and we were facing a fiscal crisis and a, 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 a cash flow crunch. And so we, we tried to find um, creative ways of reducing city subsidy, but still produce units. So we used, um, we gave extra 2020 credits to 9% deals in order to um, continue our new construction. We gave tax exemptions in order to continue to do preservation. And so we felt that we had to keep on all, all engines running on the city side, which we were successful in doing while we were doing our federal advocacy. And you've heard some, some of the advocacy that's been happening and we have been part of that advocacy, um, first to uh, get the CARES Act passed, but also now the Heroes Bill that's been um, out there. And finally, when the report started coming back of, about how COVID was playing out around the city and that it was hitting um, areas uh, where um, ma majority um, people of color lived, we figured we had to do something more, right? What we were doing was not enough. And so um, we started to look at our pipeline as part of the um, First Lady and Deputy Mayor Thompson's Task Force on Racial Equity and Inclusion to decide what what more can we do in each sector, in housing and other sectors for the long-term recovery? In terms of the housing that we're producing, a unit that you can stay in for 12 hours is not one you may want to stay in for 24 hours. And so how would should design change in the way we're building housing so that people can be more healthy in that housing? Should we be considering rooftops? Should we consider be considering balconies in um, in studios so people can have air? Should we be considering covered walkways or or rail yard space with seating areas um, that we should not be creating boxes in um, in low income areas? Also, we worked on um, mediation and um, free legal services for tenants so that when tenants call three one one that they would be able to get advice and connection to a lawyer in order to deal with um, rent arrears and their landlord uh, relationships. And the other thing we started to do with the mayor's real estate sector is to say, okay, housing is a job creator, but what is the participation of minority um, MWBE um, businesses and, and minority Authorities in this job cre creator that the city spends so much capital on. And also in terms of the unemployment numbers that we're looking at, how can we take this job creator and make the participation for um, people of color who are losing their jobs more significant in that job creator? 
and so we have been working with developers to discuss um, building skills programs, set asides and requirements as part of each project. How how much can we support new jobs and new training designated for people of color so that they can get into this industry and have skills and have permanent jobs? What do we do about our RFPs? How do we grow the MWBE participation in our projects? Should we, should we be considering that each developer partners with an MWBE and that a share of the profits and the share of the project goes towards the balance sheet for MWBs. So in terms of, of you know, hope without action being optimism misplaced, you know, we have been hoping for a short term, um, hoping that the pandemic would be of short duration, but we planned that our agency would be, con would our agents, critical agency functions would continue to work um, for the provision of not only rental subsidies, um, but code inspection, housing production, and um, housing move-ins. We've been working on the federal side to get federal subsidy, which we think is the key to supporting, uh, supporting the city and the state long-term. And then we worked with the state on the eviction in the, the evictions moratorium. We realized very early on that we needed to stop evictions. And so we worked with our state counterparts to, for, to get the first evictions moratorium till June, and then to get it extended to August. Uh, we worked with our state counterparts to also allow um, renters to use security deposits to help pay arrears. And we also uh, continue to work work with our state partners on um, how we can use ESG money, how we can help HRA increase its ability to do one shots. And the final thing I'll say is that, you know, between the CARES Act, um, HRA's one shots to help renters, that we're housing more homeless um, folks in our housing, we realized that there was a gap in the service for undocumented workers. And so when we looked at this CDBG money, and we looked at all the money that was available, we realized, okay, we have a way of doing one shots for people who um, are able to repay or qualify for one shots. There's the CARES Act that gives um, an employment insurance for people who've lost jobs. What are we going to do? None of these government benefits um, are available for the undocumented. We know that there are about 107,000 undocumented households in the city. And if you just took a 25% unemployment rate, that's a lot of folks that need help. And so what we've done, the deputy mayor and I and um, the mayor's fund, we have been working with enterprise to raise foundation money in order to use the home-based providers to provide rental assistance to the undocumented and to folks in the gig economy, to folks who are doing freelance work or part-time work or who work on contract. And so that effort is ongoing um, and we hope that it will be successful. But to wrap up, you know, we have had to work on, on the ground and respond very quickly to me in many different ways to try to stem the, the, um, what we saw as a real crisis for renters. And we continue to try to do that, but the federal government is really, really key. And we need that other stimulus to come in, in or because there is a limit to what the city and state can do and the limit to what we can do for a long time. And with that, I'll pass it back to Marissa. Thank you much, so much, Commissioner Carroll, for your practitioner's perspective and for all that you're doing for New Yorkers. I'll just close by thanking everyone for attending our Economic Inequality Policy Series focused on housing. I'd like to thank our partners, the Urban Institute and Perman Center. I'd like to encourage you all to please continue checking out our Economic Inequality Hub on our public website, newyorkfed.org. 
uh, for resources related to economic inequality. And as David mentioned, as an institution, we are deeply committed to understanding and finding solutions to various forms of economic inequality. So thank you all again for attending and we'll see you next time. Take care.